And um, for the plenary session uh, this uh, afternoon, we will have Dr. Katarina Panke from the University of Oldenburg, who will give us the presentation on trace metals as agents and tracers in the ocean and climate system. But before that, she will be formally introduced by our uh, member of our scientific committee, um, Thorsten Dittmar, also from uh, University of Oldenburg. Thorsten, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Nona. And hello and uh, welcome everybody. And first of all, congratulations to the two awardees um, of today. Very well. Uh, res um, and it was very nice and enthusiastic presentations. So my name is, is Thorsten Littmer. I'm a marine geochemistry from the University of Oldenburg uh, in Germany. And I'm part of the scientific committee of, of this meeting. And it's a great honor now to introduce today's plenary speaker, uh, Professor Katharina Panke. Yeah, when I met Katharina um, for the first time, this was about um, 10 years ago, um, she told me a very surprising story about neodymium in seawater. And I must admit that this was the very first time I heard about neodymium in seawater. So until then, um, I had not much clue about neodymium. For me, this was this rare earth element that you put into uh, magnets, these little magnets you put on the white boards. Uh, but as all that I know, that I knew from neodymium was that it is present in seawater in trace amounts. And uh, it doesn't play any role for life because it's not a limiting nutrient and it's also not toxic in seawater. Um, so, but still, Katarina took the challenge to um, develop highly sensitive methods for detecting neodymium in seawater and even the isotopes. And this is really a challenge because you have to process large volumes of water and you need uh, highly advanced mass spectrometers to detect uh, these isotopes and quantify them properly. And I was really deeply impressed by this analytical achievement. But why should one go through the trouble of analyzing such an element in their isotopes in, in seawater. But then when I heard Katharina's first talk about neodymium and other trace elements in the seawater and the isotopes, I was convinced these isotopes are really cool and, and uh, really fantastic to look at because they're great storytellers. These isotopes, they tell us um, great stories about the present ocean, they tell us stories about the past ocean, and they make us better understand the ocean of the future. And if you want to know more about these stories and, and how these isotopes work and what it's all about, stay tuned and listen to Katharina's talk. I won't spoil her introduction here. But before um, Katharina starts, I want to give you a very quick background about her. Well, she received a bachelor and master's degree in geology from the University in Kiel in Germany. And then she moved to Cardiff University in the UK, where she received her PhD in 2004 in paleoethnography. And then after three postdocs at MIT in Cambridge in the US and La Monde Earth Observatory in the state of New York, then we, she became an assistant professor at the University of Hawaii. And then a few years later, back in 2011, she was appointed head of a Max Planck research group here in, back in North Germany. And then very recently, 2019, so two years ago, she was an appointed full professor for marine isotope geochemistry here at the University of Oldenburg. So Katharina, I'm very much looking forward to your talk and please, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Torsten, for this really kind introduction. And thank you to all organizers of this really inspiring meeting for inviting me to give this presentation here. It's an amazing honor and I'm really excited to be here today and speak to you. So um, I want to talk about trace metals in the ocean and neodymium will be among them. Um, trace metals, as Torsten already said, are elements uh, that are uh, that occur in concentrations less than one ppm, but typically in concentrations even lower than that. Typically, they occur in concentrations in the PPB or PPT range. And just if you're not familiar with trace metals of these small concentrations, you can imagine 
a job of color, mixing that into the volume of one or several Olympic sized swimming pools and the concentration that this color will have them uh, is equivalent to the concentrations that these trace elements have in seawater. So it's a challenge to even collect these samples for trace metal analysis, contamination free, um, process them in the lab and analyze them precisely. But with the enormous efforts of the International Geotraces program that has the, the aim to better understand the involvement and the role of trace metals in biogeochemical cycles in the ocean, um, both the technology uh, to sample contamination free and also analyze precisely has advanced a lot. So we're a lot further now than we were say 10 years ago and we have beautiful profiles and distributions of trace metals in all ocean basins. And one example of this you see here for um, iron, dissolved iron concentrations in the ocean. So, but still, uh, why is it important to study uh, these trace metals in these low concentrations in the ocean? Um, first of all, um, there are several functions that trace metals take in. One you're all familiar with, um, that's a group of trace metals that act as micronutrients and iron is an example of that. So these micronutrients, these trace metals are central for phytoplankton growth and therefore uh, maintain primary production and sustain marine ecosystems. So it's important to understand, especially for areas where these micronutrients are limiting, a limiting factor for primary production, it is um, of interest and essential to understand how and through which input pathways these elements are supplied to the ocean. And another aspect of this of the importance of understanding these these areas of input and also the mechanisms and pathways is the fact that the different mechanisms of input have different uh, sensitivities to climate change and so if we want to understand where and through what pathways trace metals were added to the ocean in the past during um, large climatic changes or how and where they will be added to the ocean in the future it is of interest to understand these pathways also in the present ocean. And this is where another set of trace metals um, can be used. This is a set of trace metals that are not biologically active and therefore are not removed quickly from the surface ocean through uptake by phytoplankton. So they are maintained in the surface ocean or in the area of input and therefore leave a trace of uh, their supply to the ocean. And one group of these elements is the group of rare earth elements that I will talk about today. And if we not only analyze the concentration of these elements, but also their isotopic composition. And for this, we have to rely on uh, so-called radiogenic isotopes and neodymium is one of them. Um, then we can even trace these inputs back to their source regions. And this is because different source areas carry uh, different isotopic compositions that we can use as a fingerprint for these um, specific source regions. And we can even use them to trace the transport, their transport within the ocean if they have long enough residence times and neodymium and the rare earth elements do. So to illustrate, um, the use and uh, yeah, the, the systematics a little bit of neodymium isotopes. Um, um, I, I have uh, um, brought here a, a map of the distribution of neodymium isotopes in margin sediments. Um, and the neodymium isotopes um, are expressed here in epsilon neodymium notation. So the radiogenic isotope is the 143 neodymium it's normalized to a standard and it's similar to the delta notation basically, but in, in, in parts per 10,000, just because the natural variations in this ratio 
only occur in the fifth decimal place. And so it's easier if we multiply these numbers. Um, and what you see here is the distribution of epsilon neodymium values now shown in color, different colors indicating different isotopic compositions, the warm colors uh, indicating high ratios and the uh, blue colder colors indicating uh, low isotope ratios and low epsilon neodymium values. And so I don't want to go into further detail of that because that's not necessary for this talk. Um, but what is obvious from this figure is that we have a heterogeneous distribution of neodymium isotopes in different rocks on the continents, depending on the lithology and the age of the rocks. And so we have, <clears throat> we can, we can use these um, different isotope ratios and signatures to trace element inputs that are transported to the ocean uh, back to their source regions. And another aspect uh, that's important is that the fact that these isotopes, because of their high mass, are not um, fractionated during mobilization and transport to the ocean or transport within the ocean. So these original isotopic fingerprints are maintained and we can use them uh, to identify their source regions. <clears throat> Um, and in this talk, I want to look at two uh, major questions uh, using neodymium and other radiogenic isotopes and trace metals. One is uh, what is the provenance of trace metals and the relative contribution of different Siberian rivers to the transpolar drift in the Central Arctic Ocean. And the second one is uh, what is the provenance of dust supplied to the South Pacific during the last glacial maximum. So I'm looking at two different areas at, in, in both hemispheres using uh, radiogenic traces to identify trace metal inputs and particular, particularly the source regions, the provenance of these um, trace metal inputs. And this is where I want to highlight that the research I'm presenting was driven mainly by these two young scientists. One is uh, Ronja Pafrat, who's a recent PhD student who collected samples in the Central Arctic Ocean on the research vessel Polar Stern. And here you see her at the North Pole in front of the Polar Stern. And the other person is Torben Struve, who is a current postdoc in my lab. So I'm starting in the north, in the Central Arctic Ocean, where we look at the provenance of trace metals and the contribution of the different Siberian rivers to the transpolar drift. And the Arctic Ocean, as you all know, is the region that is most rapidly changing uh, or responding to climate warming and um, responding with environmental changes that have been changing over uh, over the past recent uh, decades. And you see some examples of this here. Uh, we, we see an, an increase in river discharge. And what is shown here is the discharge of the Eurasian rivers coming from Siberia and discharging into mainly the Eurasian basins of the Arctic Ocean. We see an increase in heat input by these rivers to the Arctic Ocean. And we see a dramatic decline of sea ice ext extent in, in the Central Arctic. So all of these variables are critical for the marine or for the uh, marine ecosystems in the Arctic and also for biogeochemical cycles in this unique area. And so it is important to understand the system now and the biogeochemical cycles in this area if we want to understand the impact that the climatic and environmental changes will have on the system in the future. And so in order to achieve uh, such a baseline of current trace metal uh, distributions and concentrations and the biogeochemical cycles in the Arctic, the Geotraces program started an enormous effort in 2015 by sending three research vessels into the Arctic. Um, and you see 
uh, the cruise tracks of two of these cruises here, the European cruise um, on the um, research vessel Polar Stern occupied stations in the Eurasian basin. The US cruise occupied stations mainly in the Canadian basin. And there was a third cruise that's not shown here um, from Canada that took samples in the Canadian archipelago. Uh, archipelago. And <clears throat> these two cruises of the US and uh, the European um, scientists both crossed the central Arctic Ocean here and the major surface current of the transpolar drift that collects waters on the Siberian shelves um, and transports them across the central Arctic and towards Fram Strait. So what is happening in the Arctic Ocean is, um, is also relevant um, for the Atlantic Ocean and, and beyond. And so a first, um, so first of all, uh, the, the transpolar drift, um, I said, collects waters from the Siberian shelves and sea ice, and it collects fresh water from the major Siberian rivers, the Lena, the Yenisei, and Op rivers, and they are incorporated into the transpolar drift current. And the first compilation of these uh, of the results of both of these cruises, you see in these sections here that are, that are sections along the um, this transect here shown by the red arrow crossing the transpolar drift in the central Arctic Ocean. And it's obvious that the transpolar drift contains these large amounts of fresh water from the Siberian rivers, but also high amounts of trace metals and nutrients. So you see, for example, these high iron concentrations here that are confined to the um, um, meteoric water fraction in, in, the, uh, in, this, in the transpolar drift and also high neodymium concentrations that are transported in um, with the uh, uh, Siberian rivers. And so uh, we asked the question whether we can separate the distribution, uh, the, the contribution of the different Siberian rivers that are draining into the Eurasian basin. Um, and the reason for, for um, studying this is um, mainly because um, these rivers drain different areas that are subject to different permafrost conditions. So the Lena River, for example, drains an area that is subject to permanent or continuous permafrost conditions, whereas the Yenisei and Ob have a drain areas that have um, isolated or sporadic permafrost um, conditions. So these <clears throat> rivers will likely be impacted differently by continuing climate warming, uh, leading likely to a, um, a stronger increase in river discharge and also in the uh, trace metal and nutrient concentrations in these rivers. And in order to separate these rivers, uh, neodymium isotopes come in very handy. You can already see this here. I've uh, colored the, these arrows here um, according to the different, their different isotopic compositions. So the Lena River carries an isotopic, a very negative isotopic composition of around minus 16, whereas Yenisei and Op carry signatures of around minus five to minus six. And these two contributions we cannot separate, but we can separate them from the Lena contribution and also from the main marine inflow of uh, the Atlantic water that carries an isotopic composition of minus 11. The Pacific inflow <clears throat> carries an isotope signature of around minus 5.5, um, but this water, at least as far as we know at the moment, is largely uh, restricted to the Canadian basin. And the results from these stations here that we occupied during the European cruise, where I colored the stations according to their position relative to the transpolar drift, the orange. Um, stations are outside the transpolar drift influence, and we see uh, um, um, uh, homogeneous um, concentrations of neodymium throughout the water column, uh, whereas at the stations inside the transpolar drift, we see extremely high 
surface concentrations of neodymium that are actually um, almost unprecedented for open ocean surface conditions. Typically, we find these high concentrations only in the deep Pacific Ocean. So <clears throat> clearly, the uh, rivers that carry really high concentrations of rare earth elements discharge these into the into the Arctic Ocean, and um, the and, and the transpolar drift transports them over long distance. The neodymium isotopic composition looks a little more messy in these vertical profiles. And it is therefore, well, it's not unexpected because these rivers carry different isotopic compositions. Um, and it is more useful and informative to look at them in sections similar to the ones we looked at before. So these are sections now running from the Barents Sea, uh, so from the stations outside the transpolar drift into the central Arctic and crossing the transpolar drift twice. So we have uh, the uniform neodymium concentrations and also neodymium isotopic compositions outside the transpolar drift. And under the transpolar drift influence, we see these extremely high surface concentrations of neodymium that are uh, uh, or coincide with the low salinity surface layer. And they also correlate well with salinity and also with the meteoric fraction that was um, estimated based on delta O18. And the neodymium isotopic composition you see now in this lower section here. And first of all, the, um, we see a wide range of values at over very short distance, both in the vertical and in, uh, in lateral extent. Um, and I want to highlight mainly two features here, one being this uh, blue, bubble of uh, very low isotopic compositions that is consistent with the dominant Lena influence, because this is the only source that carries these uh, very negative isotope signals into the Arctic Ocean or into the Eurasian basin of the Arctic Ocean. Um, so we have a dominance of Lena um, contribution in this area, and we can also see this in a surface map um, at from uh, zero to 10 meters water depth. Um, <clears throat> and these uh, other surface stations show a, a higher contribution of the NSA and AUG. And the other feature is this band of high neodymium con um, isotope ratios at around 100 meters water depth at all stations uh, in the transpolar drift. <clears throat> And what does this mean? It first of all means that uh, these contributions don't mix very well because we have a transition, especially uh, here uh, in the central Arctic uh, with the Lena River contribution overlying the Yenisei and Op contributions. Um, and this, the, these lateral and, and vertical um, separation suggests that we have a temporarily varying uh, discharge and particularly entrainment of these different river contributions into the transpolar drift. And we also have, uh, have different densities, uh, see different densities of these rivers due to prior mixing of the Yenisei and Ob waters in the Kara Sea with uh, marine water, and then their transport into the Laptev Sea and entrainment into the transpolar drift. So the Yenisei and Ob waters um, are mixed prior to entrainment into the transpolar drift, and they travel over a longer distance than the Lena input that has a more direct input route here into the transpolar drift. And so um, we can summarize that uh, the Siberian River contributions um, are clearly separated in the transpolar drift and they can be identified using neodymium isotopes and concentrations. And they indicate a temporarily varying entrainment into the transpolar drift and um, different densities acquired prior to um, entrance into the transpolar drift, which allows also the Lena River to override the the NSA and up contribution. So with that, I 
take you to the other side of the world, to the South Pacific, where we looked at uh, the provenance of dust that is or was supplied to the South Pacific during the last glacial maximum. Why is this of interest? Um, first of all, primary production, as you all know, is uh, limited by the availability of iron in the Southern Ocean. Um, we have high amounts of macronutrients, but because of the remoteness of this area and the particular remoteness of the um, South Pacific Ocean from any direct continental input, um, iron availability is limiting primary production. And it has been shown that during the last glacial period, dust input to the South Pacific and also the, the, the South Atlantic increased, was higher by 10 to 15 times uh, compared to today. And it was shown uh, for the Atlantic Ocean that this increased dust input promoted primary production and therefore likely contributed to CO2 sequestration from the atmosphere and therefore to the last bit of cooling during the last glacial maximum uh, 20,000 years before the present. And so why is it important to understand the dust source in this area now? This is because um, the dust provenance determines the bioavailability of the iron, or at least has the potential to do so, uh, because, um, because of the different mineralogies in the source areas, in the potential dust source areas in the Southern Ocean, which are South America, uh, South Africa, and Australia. And also the mechanism that uh, produces dust in these areas or makes dust available um, is different. We have uh, glaciers in South America that produce dust and uh, we have mainly or only aridity that um, uh, leads to dust availability in Australia. There, was no, there were no glaciers even during last glacial times in Australia. <clears throat> and it was shown by, uh, for example, Schoenfeld et al, that um, the dust produced by glaciers um, has a higher content of iron 2 which is, um, has a higher bioavailability. And in, an additional aspect is that uh, these mechanisms that make dust available or produce dust in these dust source areas are likely to respond differently to climate change. Um, glacier uh, variations are uh, yeah, uh, reacting much more slowly than aridity in Australia, for example. So the timing of dust mobilization and input may also differ if we have different um, uh, uh, or dust input from different source areas. And so we um, collected samples from the South Pacific, from across the South Pacific, um, both west east and also in a latitu latitudinal extent. And as, and as a first proof of concept uh, for using isotope fingerprinting um, to study the provenance of dust in the South Pacific, we looked at um, surface sediments at these stations from these sediment cores that represent the present day or Holocene um, situation and therefore should reflect the, the current uh, dust source um, to the South Pacific. And you see the results here for lead isotopes. We also measured neodymium and strontium, but I'm just showing lead here in order not to confuse you too much. Um, lead has the advantage that it has several uh, radiogenic isotopes. We can look at uh, two different lead isotope ratios um, and the results from the Holocene samples you see here in this yellow bubble, together with the isotope fingerprints of the potential dust source uh, regions for the South Pacific. So we have um, South America as a potential dust source region, and these um, fingerprints are shown by bubbles lined by red, orange, and yellow lines. And we have Australia and New Zealand as an additional dust potential dust source area uh, shown by blue. The other dust source areas, such as the Ross Sea and South Africa, 
we were able to um, isolate and uh, neglect here based on the isotope fingerprints. And um, looking at and, and using all these isotope fingerprints, different isotope systems, we were able to pinpoint the source to Australia mainly and um, particularly to the Lake Eyre region, which is also the most active dust source region uh, uh, today. And we find this uh, or dominance of this dust in, in the uh, South Pacific. And it's also surprising um, that the dust, uh, uh, that the isotopes that we measured here across the, the vast South Pacific show such a narrow isotope range. So this also suggests that there's not, that it's really mainly one source and not mixing of several different sources. Um, I forgot to say that, of course, we, we separate the dust, so, uh, dust fraction from the marine sediments by looking uh, or by isolating the smaller than five micron fraction that is uh, mainly uh, transported by dust. So we are not, we are uh, um, uh, um, neglecting, therefore, larger um, contributions from uh, ice rafted debris, for example. So, and uh, with this, study in mind, we collected then samples from the last glacial uh, time slice in these marine sediment cores and the results you see here in these um, green dots. And one dot is uh, represents 227 uh, measurements of um, samples from the last glacial maximum from one core. And what we see, and we can uh, zoom in on that here also, is that these last glacial samples or the isotopes fall into two different um, parts, into two different um, uh, compartments. One overlaps with the Holocene fingerprints and the Australian New Zealand fingerprints, and the other one um, tends towards the um, isotope fingerprint of Central South America. So we have most likely binary mixing here between these two sources. And if we look closer where these samples are from, we see that we have a geographic separation of these uh, contributions of these two different sources um, in the South Pacific. The Australian um, dust source is uh, limited to the Antarctic zone, whereas we see a stronger input of dust from Central South America in the subantarctic zone. So we have a consistent and a clear geographic pattern that is shown here again now in colors. We see the uh, um, Central South American source in yellow and the greenish bluish colors uh, represent the Australian source region. <clears throat> and uh, we, we see so a consistent geographic pattern and a narrow transition zone that um, is aligned more or less with the northernmost extent of the last glacial uh, sea ice extent. So we have the 40% sea ice line and the 15% sea ice line here shown in white. These are reconstructions based on the diatom um, assemblages from Rainer Gazonde. Um, and this geographic pattern and this, this very narrow transition zone suggests that this pattern cannot be controlled by atmospheric circulation alone. And so we hypothesize that seasonal variations play a role also because um, the dust source areas are active during different seasons. So Australia, um, in Australia, dust is mainly mobilized and entrained in summer, whereas in Central South America, dust is um, mobilized in winter when uh, the westerly wind belt that blows from west to east here across the South Pacific and the entire Southern Ocean um, reaches its uh, northernmost limit. And the dust here in Central South America is entrained into the subtropical jet, which is a high altitude jet that then transports the fine material all the way um, around Antarctica and deposits it in the South Pacific. Um, 
And so the mechanism that we hypothesize here is that um, during summer, which is shown here in the, in the lower right figure, uh, the Australian dust source region was active mainly um, and, and supplied dust to the entire South Pacific because sea ice extent was at its minimum. Whereas during winter season, um, and we had the additional dust source in, from Central South America um, that deposited dust uh, mainly in, in the or north of the uh, sea ice extent and the southern part was shielded by sea ice. So that this contribution only was only deposited north of um, the northernmost sea ice extent. So um, what does this mean? It means, first of all, that we have an additional dust source during, or we had an additional dust source uh, during the last glacial maximum. It is, um, if we want to believe the studies that glaciers uh, produce more bioavailable dust or iron with, with a higher content of uh, bioavailable iron, then it means that we have a dust source with a higher availability of um, iron. And um, we have um, a clear separation of these um, two different dust um, contributions to the South Pacific. So um, to summarize, we saw that we can separate the contributions of Lena and Yenisei Op in the Central Arctic Ocean uh, using radiogenic isotopes and we can trace their contributions along the transport pathway of the transpolar drift. And uh, in, in the South Pacific, we saw that we had an additional dust source that delivered dust to the subantarctic zone during the last glacial maximum. And the subantarctic sub zone is also the area where primary production most dominantly or most um, strongly responded to dust input in the, um, sub, in, in the Southern Ocean. So with that, I thank you for your attention and uh, I'm looking forward to your questions. I think there's a lot of time for that. Yeah, thank you, Katarina. That was a wonderful talk, a wonderful overview of all this great work. And we have indeed time for, for questions. So please, if you could just type in the questions in the, in the chat, and then I can read it to everyone. Yeah, I'm always fascinated that the dust from uh, South America makes it all the way around the globe um, to end up in Antarctica. Now, this was uh, this is a really surprising result. Yeah. So, are there any questions? Please use the chat. Okay, is there also paleo support of carbon sequestration when there were greater iron inputs from South America? So there is um, evidence from the South Atlantic indeed that um, primary production increased and the deposition of organic matter in, in um, marine sediments. So there's a, a correlation of dust concentrations or, or iron concentrations in in the uh, um, uh, fossil marine sediments and organic matter. And uh, this is also supported by um, nitrogen isotopes, for example, that indicate a higher, um, uh, indicate higher iron uptake uh, and, and primary production during that time. Mm -hmm. So is it likely that iron was not limiting to production in the Southern Ocean at the LGM? I wouldn't go question. that far, to be honest, um, because we have really high concentrations of macronutrients in the Southern Ocean and the, iron, the, the dust contributions are still small, but it looks like they're large enough to, to promote um, primary production in the Southern Ocean during, during the LGM. So it was likely that the Southern Ocean was more productive in the LGM than now? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So there's another question from Craig Cutter. Does the extensive Arctic shelf modify the Lena sig notes? I guess he refers to the, um, the trace elements you were studying. Yeah, right. So, um, um, yes, of, of course, there, there are likely also shelf contributions um, to the signal. They're likely to be similar, at least in front of the Lena input um, in an isotopic composition than the Lena signal. But based on, <clears throat> on rare earth element um, patterns and concentrations, we were not able to identify a strong release of um, rare earth elements from particles. At least uh, from uh, the rare earth elements, it's not obvious that there's an additional input from the shelf or from uh, particles, from, from river particles added to the Arctic Ocean. I have a follow-up question on that. So we, we can assume that um, the traces are really conservative traces for linear water in the Arctic. So if we want to trace non-conservative properties from the Lena, for example, um, the soft organic matter, we could use your traces as conservative um, conservative baseline for that. Um, yes. Uh, well, it's in, in the Arctic Ocean, the, the um, situation seems to be um, special. We do not have this, uh, we do have a removal, uh, this estuarine effect that Greg mentions here. Um, but it, it doesn't seem to be as strong as in, in other areas because of the high um, DOC concentrations in the rivers. And we suspect that um, rare earth elements and other trace metals are stabilized also by um, dissolved organic matter in this area. Okay, thank you. So, Greg Cutter added to so there's no estuarine effect and no one cares about DOC toss. I'm not taking this personal. So, uh, we can go to uh, Susan Schneider's. Uh, question. When the ice melted, what happened to the dust that was deposited on the ice? Yes, a very good question. Um, uh, what we suspect, and we can only suspect this, is that um, first of all, the iron that's added to the subantarctic zone where it fuels productivity um, is transported to the sediment column more quickly because of uh, aggregation. Um, whereas the, the fine dust that's, uh, that's deposited on, on the ice um, is then transported um, when the ice melts, is then transported by the ocean currents away from that area. Um, and we're not saying that there's no contribution of the South American dust to the Antarctic zone. It's just not uh, the, the dominant source. So we also uh, performed some mixing model calculations and uh, they confirm that uh, they, we have a dominant uh, dust source from Central South America in the subantarctic zone and of um, Australian sources south of it. There's a question from Rainer Amon. It looked like that the soft iron and neodymium signals were not aligned completely in the Central Arctic. Uh, any idea why? Um, uh, well, iron is, is, um, is, is bioactive, neodymium is not. That's one um, possibility. Um, I think we didn't have all the, we didn't analyze all the stations that another, that, and, and the, there was an over um, interpolation, extrapolation in that figure. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So did this answer your question, Rainer, or do you have a follow-up on that? Or well, any, any further questions? Mm -hmm. So I know everyone wants to talk off the line with you. That's good, very good. Um, okay. Compliments to Katharina, nice compilation, indeed. Let's just wait a few more seconds. Sometimes it takes a while until one types into the chat. So if there are no further questions to Katharina, I would like to thank Katharina again for this uh, indeed very nice uh, compilation and great talk. And then I would uh, like to hand over again to Nona who has some concluding remarks. Uh, for